and welcome to this week's Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero, opening with the BBC Symphony Orchestra playing Dvorak's Symphony No. 9 in E minor, beautifully conducted by this week's guest. Why are we opening with this piece? Well, for the first time in its history, the BBC prom season was opened and closed by female conductors. The responsibility for this year's prestigious first night at London's Royal Albert Hall fell to acclaimed Ukrainian-born Finnish conductor Dalia Stasevska, leading the BBC Symphony Orchestra once again with passion and energy. From the proms to a run of premiering the revival of Benjamin Britten's iconic A Midsummer Night's Dream at Glyndebourne with the London Philharmonic. And now she's back home in Finland, where she grew up. In between conducting some of the world's finest orchestras and mastering complex scores, Dahlia has raised in the region of £200,000 for the conflict in Ukraine. And she's been driving aid trucks to the city of Lviv, where millions of people, including friends and family, are still suffering because of Russia's continuing attack. Attacks. I'm thrilled she's found time and a hugely busy musical schedule to join me from Finland. Dalia, your feet have barely touched the ground. How are you? Well, thank you for having me on your podcast. It's very nice. I'm really well, but this season has been very busy. I think the busiest I've ever had. Well, in fact, you just told me before we started recording that you're in a new apartment that you've only spent a handful of days in this year. Yes, we moved to a new flat in March. We were just laughing with my husband that I've spent here like around 10 days. And even those are just kind of like coming in the evening and leaving (laughs) next morning. Not a very good investment, but now I'm going to stay here for a longer time as I'm having a baby, hopefully in one month. I know. So I will have a little bit time off here for three months. Well, congratulations. I'm glad that you're taking a a few months off and you are embarking on a new and exciting personal adventure. Are you excited, Dahlia? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You've just finished your debut at Glyndebourne, conducting A Midsummer Night's Dream with the London Philharmonic. How was it? It was a fantastic experience and fantastic period, to be honest. I followed Glyndebourne Opera Festival, I think, for over 10 years. And uh, it has been a dream to conduct there. And of course, uh, when the invitation came and they suggested for me to do Britain Opera, Britain who is really close to my heart as a composer, his music. So like all the stars were in the right position. It was a really great, great honor to work on this piece and have so many also shows. I think we had 12 performances, so you really could grow up and to see also how the British audience love this piece and know it so well, you know, and of course, combination with Shakespeare, it's something really unique that I don't see so much, uh, of course, in abroad with Britain's operas. So it was um, great in all over experience. I hear it was your first time conducting a British opera. And I'm just wondering why Benjamin Britten's music means so much to you and is special, Dahlia. I think there's something Nordic about it. I don't know. (laughs) Is it that Finland and Nordics are in a way isolated like uh, (laughs) Great Britain is, you know, Ireland. We have the same topics, the weather. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, there's something Nordic also about the set of mind and some kind of, how would I put it in words, melancholy maybe, that I I feel similarities. And that's why Britain's music especially has like somehow touches me really that the music always is somewhere, the emotions is there under the surface. You sometimes need to search for them and they are very deep and sometimes passionate, but all around things that I've been thinking why British music or Britain is so close to me. Maybe it's because of these few things. Oh, and do you have a favorite piece when you conduct something like that? Not especially. It's more about composers and their worlds 
and having this lifelong adventure in discovering their music, their repertoire and growing with it, you know, so it's a constant dialogue and there's so much to discover. It's such a wonderful story to unravel, isn't it? When you're interested in composers and music, we interviewed a radio broadcaster here who presents a very well-known classical show for Radio 4. And she talked about the stories of the conductors and how the music brings those stories to life. Is it like that for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. In a way, you really have to dig in into the composer's world, sit by the coffee table and try to understand which kind of world he or she was in. Where does this music come from? You know, what did they experience? What influenced that? And also to see that in a bigger also time lapse, that where did they start and where is the traveling going and leading and all that. So I feel always as a conductor that I really have to become a composer in that sense to understand as much as I can. But also you need to have freedom for yourself and your personality because music is communication. It's first the composer and it's, you know, he or she composes the piece and then they let it go for us to discover. So the first step is, of course, for me to discover and to have that dialogue with the music and with the composer. And then, of course, the next step is to have that dialogue with the orchestra to share those. And then the final stage is the dialogue with the audience. So there's a really many steps to have. And music in general, it's always a very private experience, but it's also a communal experience. So it has so many levels and none of them are right or wrong. That's why it's one of the greatest art forms. It's open to everybody as they want to take it. It's one of the most beautiful art forms and it's wonderful that you've managed to make a beautiful and very successful career out of it. I would imagine it brings a lot of joy to your heart. And did Glyndebourne bring a lot of joy to your heart? You mentioned there you've looked at Glyndebourne for many years. This was your debut there. Was the atmosphere just every bit as exciting, Dahlia, as you expected it to be? Absolutely. First of all, I, I really want to somehow celebrate the whole organization. The conditions that they make there for artists are really exceptional. So they really take care for the artist. You feel appreciated. And also the conditions to work on pieces are fantastic. One of the key elements is that uh, you have the same orchestra and the same people there. So to say real world, you know, uh, like seasonal world, you sometimes you work a long period with uh, singers, but when it comes to the orchestra, you can have every single evening at different bunch of players that you haven't even met really? in rehearsing. Yes, this is very oh. normal. So the rotation can be quite harsh, actually. So there's always limitations that what you can do. But in Glyndebourne, you have the same orchestra from day one until the, your last performance. So basically what you agreed and you worked on, they are there, you know, because the people don't change. Plus, you have a lot of performances. So you really can grow with them. You know, you become more free in a way because you gain confidence and you have repetition. So this is something that I really, really enjoyed and uh, celebrate. It's, it's a really exceptional place. And of course, the location is it's like, a, I call it Disneyland <laughs> <laughs> for the opera lovers. What an incredible place to come enjoy the whole day. And this opera and picnic concept, I love it. It's just so fantastic. And we always talk a lot about accessibility and you don't have to dress up and, you know, just be yourself when you come to cultural events. And that's really right to lower, you know, that how you should behave in a sense. But at the same time, I really, really enjoyed this kind of like a Disneyland feeling that people are wearing their better clothes than I've seen in <laughs> weddings, you know, that you really invest in it and you bring these beautiful picnic baskets and you enter another world, you know, you close up everything else and you just enjoy this beautiful countryside and the music, great company. And I think that this is something really special and you have this kind of like full experience. I was actually thinking now in the summer, my husband is heavy metal bass player. And I sometimes like to go to heavy metal festivals, of course. And 
you see, they're also like, I mean, it's low key, but people dress up, you know, it, it's they? an event. It doesn't differ from blind bird in that sense <laughs> much. You have the, your own protocols. They also enter, you know, own world and they have their own fan things that they love to do. So I enjoyed the full 360 experience there. And of course, I went to see myself some shows and had all the picnic stuff uh, oh. and dressing up. So it was really lovely. Hang on, and all this off the back of the proms. Now, I know that you're not a stranger to the proms. And in fact, you were due to close last year's last night, which was cancelled, sadly, due to the death of the Queen. How did you feel when they contacted you and said, will you open this year? Well, of course, happiness. (laughs) I think to open the proms is uh, really a great honor. And secondly, proms is by far my favorite classical music festival. And if I can say the greatest classical music festival, it's a very special one. So, of course, you don't have to think twice when they ask you to do that. No, I bet. I mean, I watched you on television and I was trying to imagine what the whole experience feels like for you. Can you give us a sense of what it's like, perhaps from the moment you're in the wings before you step out there? Proms is the greatest classical music festival. The presence of the audience, this hall, Royal Albert Hall, the history of this festival, and plus BBC Symphony Orchestra as its core of the festival, it all makes it such a unique celebration. You really feel like you're coming to a rock concert every time when you go on stage. And of course, I've done already quite a few promises, so I know in a way what to expect. So it's just a huge joy conducting at the proms and to open the proms festival as well. This was actually my second time opening the proms ah, because I didn't know uh, that. many people don't remember it, but I opened the first proms that was open to audiences after the corona virus. Oh, did you? Yes, but of course it was still, we were all in a different mindset back then. Very different experience in that sense. I could imagine. Do you get any nerves at all, Dahlia? Any, any nervous adrenaline or, you know, some artists, some actors say they feel a bit sick before they go on or are you kind of full of beans and just ready to get out there? I think I'm more like kind of ready to go out there and this kind of healthy adrenaline, it's very important to have, of course, but I don't think that I'm uh, nervous as a person. I'm more always like thrilled to go on stage. And and I know always that even if I would be nervous, for example, if I do a piece for the first time, there's so many things to think of. The moment my baton goes down and orchestra starts playing, I, I forget about my small problems and the music takes along. You have such verve and energy and you look to me as if you enjoyed every single moment of the performances. Yes, I do. I feel really lucky every time I go on stage. I couldn't imagine for myself a greater profession, to be honest. So it's, it's such a, a lovely thing. It's a to work, say. but it's also really a passion for me. And what work goes in beforehand, if we're thinking about the first night of the proms, when you're conducting, well, you're always conducting, I was going to say such stunning and complicated scores, but I suppose you're always doing pretty complicated scores. But how much work goes in before you actually step out for that performance? And how much time have you spent with the orchestra on the pieces that you're working on together? So private preparation can vary for me from a week till months, and it really depends. So when I usually grab for the first time a classic, let's say. I usually want to have a few months, but it doesn't mean that I study it every day, but there is like certain reading through processes. Also, if the composer is known to me, then I don't need to make any more certain researches, let's say about the life or surroundings, or I don't need to get to know the style, let's say like that, that I know the style of the composer. It all makes uh, the preparation period a little bit 
It can make shorter, but it can make also easier the time you need to put into it. And then, of course, if you see complicated contemporary scores, the work can be quite extensive to put into that. But it depends, again, on the style quite a lot. So is it like hardcore modernism with uh, every single bar changing a measure? <laughs> or is it like a minimalistic piece, you know? So with minimalistic piece, I could have one week and with some hardcore contemporary, you sometimes need many weeks and actually then you prepare it for every single day. If you do an opera, that I usually start to prepare one year before because yeah, well, thinking of like, for example, Britain's Midsummer Night's Dream, I mean, it's three hours of nonstop sounding music just to read it through takes it three hours and then you have to work on everything. So you need really to prepare it well in advance and start the process. Also, if it's foreign language to you, you need to translate it, not only translate it, but understand that the language that they are singing, even though you don't understand, you know exactly every single word, what it means, because composer always has the text first, and then he or she composes the music. So everything is in a dialogue. There, the process can be very long. And I always say that the learning opera is quite painful also process because they are such gigantic pieces and you have to really understand not only the music, but the theater behind it. What is the big form? What is the drama? So there's a lot of things that you need to work on. And after this private <laughs> practicing that goes always on a free, of course, owns free time, we have an orchestra rehearsing time. And usually there are two or three days of preparation. And with BBC Symphony Orchestra, for example, we have three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon for two days. Then we have a general rehearsal and a concert. And if it's a really complicated and a long program, we can have a, still a third day of rehearsals. So they're kind of like always checked. But basically the idea is that the first day with an orchestra, we read the piece through a few times. So everybody just get the sense of the things. On the second day, we practice all the pieces again, but more on detail levels. We fix some things like wrong notes, wrong rhythms, talk about bowings, how to breathe, you know, where to breathe, very technical. But also we can talk about like colors, techniques, like what kind of big lines we want to build up. And third day or the general is more or less putting all this information together and practicing for the concert performance. So there we again play just through without stopping. So everybody gets again sense of the flow and can put all the rehearsed pieces into a context. What I find extraordinary, having had a tiny bit of experience of youth orchestras when I was a teenager, I played percussion. I remember Jeffrey Babb was our conductor and he was in his 80s with kind of crazy curly grey hair and very, very flamboyant. But what's extraordinary when you describe that process, Dahlia, is that whatever role you have in the orchestra, whether you're playing violin or oboe or percussion or whatever, these scores are a big deal for each individual musician. But you as the conductor have to be across everybody's music. So the knowledge, that kind of blows my mind a little bit about how detailed you have to know everything, because I know what work goes in for each individual member of the orchestra. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a lot of hours, a lot of work. But as in any profession, you gain also that knowledge, you know, you don't have to learn it all over again. So you become quicker, though the music can be new. There's certain things that you gather through your life in your toolbox, like, for example, knowledge of the composer, of the style. There's a lot of repetitive things. So in a certain way, it does get quicker. I'm not saying that it gets easier ever, but the preparation process goes quicker. Not matter, are you a violinist learning your, your part or then a conductor who, whose task is to learn everybody's parts, plus decide on a, on a bigger lines and interpretation. But it is a very demanding work in many ways, because you're responsible also. So <laughs> you, you certainly are. And as well as all this very responsible work and nurturing your new baby who's on his or her way, you were born in Kiev. So you've also had your eye on the terrible things that have been happening over the last 18 months, as well as 
as I mentioned in the introduction, doing some really valuable practical help to help friends and family and fellow Ukrainians. But I just wonder what it's been like for you, Dalia. I find it's been heartbreaking for us as a family, and we don't have any family in Ukraine, watching what's been going on and the suffering people are going through and the frustration that we can't help more. But what has it been like for you witnessing the last 18 months? Well, it's been, of course, horrible. And as you say, to see innocent people suffer, they've thrown into reality that they didn't want and that they didn't choose for, and for any reason except uh, Russia's imperialistic ideas and fixation with over hundreds of years destroying Ukrainian culture. It's even difficult to describe. I, I don't feel that there's even a moment to reflect on that. It's, it's kind of like a different reality that I live in. Ukraine is constantly on my mind, number one, when I wake up and number one, when I go to sleep. Basically, all other life goes around that. And my main focus is just how to use maximally my platform for people to get accurate information, what's happening in Ukraine, uh, not to get tired of this war, because when we can take a sleep, the war machine is eating Ukrainians every single day and they can't sleep and they are not safe anywhere. We can't just let us get tired because this is not normal. There's nothing normal about this situation. As long as the war continues, I'm trying as a volunteer just to help as much as I can. I'm very lucky that I have two amazing brothers that we teamed up with from the very start of this second war now since 2014 for this big attack. And we have been fundraising constantly money on a weekly basis, purchase things and deliver what is necessary to Ukraine for those people who help in the front lines and also the civilians and to just try to keep the flow going all the way. But it is kind of reality that I'm living in at the moment. And I find that doing music is for me in a way, you know, when the war started in 22, I was thinking canceling conducting for some time and just concentrating 100% on volunteering because I knew that the situation is really bad. And all hands are necessary, mine too. But I'm actually, I'm glad I didn't because I would have gone crazy without music. The things that you see, experience and read about there, it's so not normal and it's so painful. But in a way, I found that the music became for me even more like a celebration of humanity. And it reminds me of all the good things. And it almost like recharges my batteries every time so I can actually concentrate on all helping Ukraine. But also I found somehow comforting being myself and sharing through speeches, through playing Ukrainian music that we all feel because most of the world feels really for Ukraine and wants to help. And I really felt in a different way, this musical community and the audience, the orchestras, the support, and, and that we all need also these spaces where we can share what we all see and feel like how wrong it is and how we all feel that we want to help, but we sometimes are a little bit helpless, like what we can do that I can have this platform to say to normal civilians, look, I'm also just civilian, but there's so much we can do. It feels so little, but when we all do something little, it becomes a bigger thing. It becomes a movement of goodness over evil, you know, and this we need. And many times Ukrainians have talked to me when I'm worried or for them that don't worry about us. We know what we are doing here, but make sure that people don't forget us abroad. We need our voices heard that we are not forgotten. You've done so much, Dahlia, because you've helped those voices be heard through your music. You've done lots of high profile interviews, certainly that I've seen while you've been in the UK. You've been able to talk about what's going on there, but you've also done an awful lot on the practical front. I just wondered what it was like when you went to Lviv and what kind of aid things you were taking. I think I read one article where you'd been traveling across Helsinki looking for generators because, of course, many people had no power. So what kind of things did you take in and how was the experience because it's also dangerous too isn't it going into a situation yeah. like that for you you know every single month it's different the demands are different for example after the kakovka dam was blown up 
there was really regions where they just were out of food because there were so many people that needed help and clean water and just food. So we just immediately gathered stacks of food and stacks of water purifying things and just delivered just a few days after the Kokovka Dam was blown by the Russians. But then, for example, in the winter, uh, last winter, when they were bombing all the infrastructure, so we brought those generators you know, it's not like I order it somewhere. It's actually me and my brothers driving with the cars all around Finland, just buying everything what we can get hands on. For example, I've delivered 20,000 woolen socks that were knitted by just ordinary Finnish people. So I made this kind of announcement in a newspaper. I said, let's deliver warmth to Ukraine. It's a small thing, but it's very important. There's also a historical connection because when Finland was in war with Russia. All the female at home were always knitting woolen socks to the soldiers. So there was this kind of connection. Also deliver sleeping bags, medication, first aid, shovels, cars to evacuate people. This is something has been also a core for us. We have delivered one of my biggest last deliveries was shampoos, uh, diapers, you know, for old people, for kids. So it can be really anything. It's constantly changing. I've been myself twice in Ukraine now during the wartime, driving the lorry myself to Ukraine, once with my brother and once just alone. And it's quite heartbreaking driving into Ukraine and seeing the reality that people are living in. Air raids is just another normal day, you know, sitting in a bomb shelters. And you, of course, understand that there's nothing normal about it. And it's heartbreaking to see small kids run from schools, kindergartens doing that. When you enter Ukraine, you see endlessly graves, you know, so endlessly roadblocks for safety and security. Lviv, for example, is, of course, wrapped completely with all sandbags, all the monuments. Every single bomb shelter from Second World War (laughs) is opened and uh, I think maybe one of the most powerful and heartbreaking moments for me was my first visit to Lviv. We just delivered with my brother our relief load truck to the volunteers that we worked with. And we went to the central market to have just a breakfast. And on the left side, we could see buses loading with young people going on the front lines. And then suddenly on the right side, we hear this lonely, beautiful trumpet player, and then suddenly masses of people walking towards the city hall that is in this central market square. And everybody's kneeling and they are burying somebody that died in the front line. And the mayor is saying goodbyes to every single. And then we understood that these funerals are every single day and they are burying at least five people every single day. And every single day, mayor says goodbyes. And every single day, people come there in masses and kneel. So this reality was really uh, heartbreaking. And at the same time, people have to continue their normal lives also, you know. The country has to move, you know, otherwise it will collapse. And of course, you see the presence of the refugees, like the Ukrainian refugees. So you see them a lot. And you see the amazing resilience of the people and the belief that we will win this and we everybody does everything to help my uh, like musical family in Solviv orchestra that I also have conducted now during the war a few times when you enter their concert hall it's like you would imagine entering the Royal Albert Hall all the corridors are full of uh, boxes with the aid that is going to civilians and frontline workers on the worst areas so The orchestra, on every free time, they are just working on aid. And the concert hall, all the foyer is filled with boxes, just, you know, and it tells about the level of commitment of the people there. Everybody does something to help Ukraine to win this war and in this impossible and such a tragic situation that they are in. Do you worried earlier that the 
conflict, you know, like all conflicts in another country drops down the headlines and that perhaps fatigue sets in. Here, Ukraine isn't the top story every day, yet all these horrors continue. Yet war doesn't fatigue, does it? No. And of course, it's not a conflict. It's a war of aggression. Ukraine didn't have anything to do with this conflict. Well, if it would be a conflict, you know, you need a two people for that. Uh, yes, this is my constant worry that, you know, if I could put it so, in a totalitarian regime <laughs> that the Russia is, they don't have to think about elections, about those kind of things. They don't think about their people. They, It's just, you can do whatever you want to. But of course, in democracy, there's other problems. There's elections coming. People are worried about those things. So, of course, these kind of things influence and when somebody is a great politician for Ukraine and the next day there's somebody else who just doesn't get it and then Ukraine has to go all over this diplomacy again in a situation where you cannot lose a single minute because single minute means that they lose their best people, innocent people who are putting their lives to. So, of course, it's scary that when Ukraine is not every single day the headline because you know what the reality is there. At the same time, I'm so grateful for the amazing support that the Western countries have given. But at the same time, there is a big frustration. Why do we wait all the time so long for things to happen? Like all this year, while we were waiting for a proper armory to arrive to Ukraine, the Russia could build this unbelievably heavy minefields that they are trying now to get through. And while other world is saying maybe Ukrainians are not doing after all, well, try yourself to, you know, when we were begging for a year to help us quicker, and then suddenly you have to like break through these minefields, you know, like, the, and I find that Ukraine finds constantly itself in this bizarre situation where they have to prove that they can fight. They are not superior power. They have less people. They are less advantaged in that sense. But then they still have to show their superhumanity against this monster that doesn't care for its people, doesn't care how many thousands of tanks they throw at Ukrainians. So in order the West would say, ah, yeah, you can fight. No, maybe in few months we will give you few things more, you know. But a few months always means so many lives. And Ukraine just doesn't have that resource, endless, that Russia is willing to throw, you know, there. So it's a very frustrating situation. And at the same time, I'm so grateful that finally Western world eyes have opened. There is other things going on in the world with China, India, North Korea. It feels like there is like this kind of battle, who is going to be the next superpower and uh, change the world order. So in a way, it has been also a wake up call for us. What is our place for Western world, for Europe, for America? It's something that freedom and democracy is something that we need to fight for when this kind of powers try to to demolish what we, we've built in a way. And also we see a lot of influence also in our democracies. There's a lot of, how do you say, underground work that tries to destabilize our also world. So there's a lot to think of that it's not just a war in Ukraine. Ukraine actually is the front line at the moment for our democratic values. And they are keeping it at the moment from coming to our doorsteps in that physical way that Ukrainians are experiencing. So this is something that I see that people more and more understand. And I'm just hoping the depth of understanding how crucial it is to be courageous and to make right decisions and not to postpone also them t when it's too late. The same way like we saw Second World War, there would have been so many possibilities to stop it before it expanded in a, such a tragic way. So this is something that I've been thinking a lot and I hope that people around the world realize it, that there's so much at stake for us all. You put it so eloquently. 
you were born in Kiev, but you didn't grow up in Ukraine, but it was your grandmother, wasn't it, who passed on the love for the country and painted a beautiful picture of it for you when you were growing up. Yes, yes, she did. And I'm so immensely grateful that though not growing up in Ukraine, she gave us a glimpse to that culture, to the country that she grew up, that she loved so dearly and kind of like an access to it that I only understood, of course, later that I could access Ukraine so much more easier because of her commitment to it and the love that she shared and all the knowledge. So yes, that was something really, really beautiful. Really beautiful. I just wanted to go back, if I may, because I don't want to take too much of your time, but to your childhood. Your parents gave you a violin, I think, when you were eight. How does that translate from a violin at eight to eventually becoming a conductor? Being a conductor isn't something that you look at with a careers teacher, for example. Somebody might aspire to be a violinist or a musician, but I'm just wondering where the conducting came in and whether you were really in love with music right from those very early days of learning violin? So when I started playing violin, it was not really my choice. It was more my parents' choice. I grew up in a quite strict household and it was clear from day one that this is going to become my profession. Really? Yes. It was not a hobby uh, in any sense. The amount of time we put from day one was very kind of aiming to become a professional. So there was always this kind of conflict, I think, with playing violin. But I was very lucky that in my early teenage years, I kind of like found myself love to music. And it was through opera, listening to Madame Butterfly. And I completely became addicted to the orchestra sound and to the opera drama and started to actually dream about becoming an orchestra musician. So that was something that I really enjoyed. So in a way, something that was more or less forced became also something that I learned to love, really. But because I loved orchestra music so much, it kind of like all made sense to me that when I, for the first time, saw a female conductor, I think I was like around 22 years old. And I was like, wow, there's somebody that looks like me. And I never had the even idea that I could conduct. But in the same sense, it made all sense because I was so actively involved in playing in orchestras. I had scores myself. I loved to read them. So when I took baton, it was instantly that this is something that I've never experienced in my life before. It was so difficult and because I just played violin, you know, I didn't know to what to do anything else and conducting is something completely different. So that challenge was one of the drives and also because I loved orchestra as an instrument and suddenly being in charge made all sense to me that I wanted to pursue it. And also the third thing is because it was something that I chose to do something that wasn't ever forced to me. So those three things played a big role why I decided that this is what I want to do, you know, and then I gave all my focus on starting to study conducting. Fantastic. Now, as you know, we've been asking all our guests this season, Dahlia, what's the biggest risk you've ever taken in your life? And I'm wondering what yours is. I think it's becoming a conductor, to be honest. Yeah. This is the biggest risk and the best risk that I've ever done. And it really determined so many things for me in my life as a person and as a musician. So I think I'm really glad I did that. (laughs) I'm really glad you did that too. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, against all the odds. I'm really glad that you did that too. You've got a new album, haven't you, too, coming out or out already? Which one? Well, I don't know. A few albums saw, coming out. <laughs> I saw something on Instagram and then I realized I hadn't put that in my notes. So which yeah, album so have you got coming out? There's two or three albums coming out in the next season. The first one is going to be my recording with Lahti Symphony Orchestra, where I'm chief conductor. And we are putting the first album of composer called Helvi Leviska. She is the first female symphonist uh, in Finnish music history. And a few years ago, when I got to know her music, I was shocked that nobody has recorded her. And it's over 30 years since she passed. 
So that was something that I felt really passionate about doing the task. So we are recording all her main orchestral works. So four symphonies and two suites. And uh, the first album now is coming out in December. And then next year in March, I'm having this mixtape album coming with eight contemporary pieces by living composers together with BBC Symphony Orchestra and it's coming together with Platoon and Apple Music. So this is my another very interesting project coming up. So although you're going to be busy with a beautiful little baby very shortly, you've still got lots of things going on. Just a final thought, Dalia, do you have a favourite composer or do you have lots of favourites? Well, I'm really passionate about contemporary as a musician to give platform to living composers and be in an active dialogue with them. I find it so wonderful to be part of their world and how do they hear the world that surrounds us and on which new adventures they are taking us. I want to be part of the now our day Britons, you know, and uh, discovering the world together through their music. But from past (laughs) composers, maybe I would always go back to Sibelius. He has been my companion for such a long time and I feel a very deep, deep connection to his music and I feel really passionate about his music and I feel like a kid every time opening his scores that where he will lead me this time. And of course I had relationship with his music for such a long time. So I think this friendship with Sibelius' music is something really, really special. And it will, of course, continue until the end of this journey. I don't really have a great knowledge of Sibelius, so that's what I shall go and do now. Go and find some of his music, preferably with you conducting. Do you know, Dalia, it's really, truly been an honour to chat to you today. It's been a few weeks in the making, and I feel like I've immersed myself a little bit in your world in preparation for today's podcast. So thank you, and also really admire the way you've used your music as a platform to keep the plight of Ukrainian people in our hearts and minds, and as well as providing practical help and support. I think one of the stories that you told today that really touched me was the knitting of the socks. That really does make me realise that everybody can help, even if it's a little bit. We can make a big difference, can't we, if we all pull together? Absolutely. And listen, you'll make a wonderful mum. Um, try and take a little bit of rest now. You've been running all over the place. I'll let you get on with the rest of your day, but thank you, Dahlia. Thank you. You've been listening to conductor Dalia Stasevska speaking to me from her home in Finland. Don't forget to download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'm going to leave you now with Dalia conducting more of Dvorak's Symphony No. 9 in E minor with the BBC Symphony Orchestra. 